in pursuit of health and wisdom. Sapio with Buck Joffrey. Welcome back to Sapio with Buck Joffrey. This is Buck Joffrey. Now this is a This will be an interesting show. I want to share something that happened to me very recently and uh, talk a little bit about that experience. I hope maybe that it'll potentially help save someone else's vision. So last week, my peripheral vision in my right eye towards the nose, I was starting to feel like there was like a, a little bit of a shadow there or a curtain or something like that. And as it turns out, I went in on Friday, um, uh, last Friday, and I had a retinal tear and a detachment caused by something called a vitreous detachment. And I'm going to get into that. Um, It was, um, you know, obviously it's a little scary. I had to have immediate surgery, but thanks to quick medical attention, surgical intervention, my vision was saved. You know, it should go back completely to normal. In some cases, though, if this particular issue is not actually dealt with, can result in permanent, uh, complete vision loss. So I thought it would be a good idea to talk about this because it's probably not something that you, most people have heard of even. Uh, but if you're wondering, by the way, why I'm kind of have my head down, I'm supposed to have my head kind of facing down because there's a gas bubble uh, in my eye, pushing back on my retina sort of is a like a splint. So technically, I'm supposed to most of the time for this first week or so have my face completely down. I'm cheating a little bit uh, just to kind of uh, look up the screen so it's not too completely weird, but, um, but that's what I'm doing. So anyway, let me walk you through what happened, explain some of the underlying anatomy, risk factors, uh, and then I'll describe the treatment I received. And again, my hope is that sharing this, if you ever have this, you'll save your own vision. Or if you are around somebody who's having this issue, you'll be like, hey, you better get to an ophthalmologist quick. So let's start a little bit by just talking a little bit about the anatomy of the eye. And if uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, I'm sure my fine producer, Phil, is putting up some images to follow. But I'll try to be descriptive for those of you who are uh, simply listening, you know, the eye is, it's actually, you know, it's a very complex organ, as you can imagine, lots of different structures uh, that ultimately allow us to, uh, to see the front part of your eye is only the beginning, right? You have the cornea and the iris and the, you know, the lens behind that and all that. But um, one of the structures is the vitreous and uh, it's a gel like substance that fills up this space between the lens and the retina at the back of the eye. And the the retina is a thin layer of of, uh, tissue that lines um, the inside of the eye. And it's absolutely crucial for vision because it really is the the thing that converts light into signals uh, that ultimately the brain can interpret as images. So, The thing that happens uh, is that as we age, the vitreous, no matter what, you know, whether you're a healthy person or not, it it just begins to change. It becomes less gel-like and more liquid. And as it's sitting against the retina, it starts to separate from it. And this process is known as a uh, posterior vitreous detachment. You'll never know that this happened to you. In fact, I know it happened in my left eye from this, I had no idea it, it, it happened until I, I went in to, to see the ophthalmologist, but I knew that that happened and I never knew when it happened. However, in some cases, this separation that I'm talking about can lead to some uh, uh, more serious complications, like I had such as the uh, retinal tear or detachment or so, some combination of both. So what happened to me? So again, in my case, the vitreous uh, detaching away from the retina wasn't quite as benign. So as the vitreous pulled away from the retina, it actually, it, it caused a little tear. You can imagine it just a little sticky and it's pulling away and actually like tears, uh, tears a little bit of that curtain with it, that retinal tissue. As you can imagine, there's a bunch of fluid back there. You know, you've got this little tear under that curtain and that allows fluid to seep behind uh, that curtain and starts lifting it up 
and lifting away from the back of the eye, that is uh, called a detachment. And if the retina uh, detaches, it, it can lose blood supply, uh, and if not treated quickly, can lead to permanent vision loss. So retinal detachment, uh, which, you know, the tear and the detachment, it's, it's definitely a medical emergency because it's a time of, uh, the time is of the essence. The sooner it's treated, uh, the better chances of saving your vision. For me, again, I was fortunate, got a prompt surgical intervention. But before I get into uh, the details of the surgery, let's talk about some of those symptoms. I talked to you about what my uh, particular symptoms were, but I can uh, certainly uh, you know talk more broadly because I think it's important uh, to be aware of these types of things. So the symptoms of a retinal tear or detachment, they can actually be really subtle at first, and they were for me. But again, they're really important to recognize. And one of the most common signs is the sudden appearance of, of floaters, uh, small dark shapes that drift across your field of vision. Now, this for me was uh, tricky because, uh, and this may be related to why I had the tear, is I have had bad floaters my entire life. I remember even as a kid, I had bad floaters. And floaters are like pieces of that vitreous gel. There's obviously something wacky about my vitreous uh, maybe it was a little stickier or whatever. In fact, I know it was stickier because that's what the ophthalmologist uh, told me after surgery. Whatever the case may be, if you don't have floaters and all of a sudden you have a bunch of uh, these dark shapes and drifting across your field of vision, these that can be a sign. You know, floaters, again, are actually quite common in general. People have them, They're usually harmless, but a sudden increase in their number uh, can actually be a warning of, of the retinal tear. Other symptoms that people talk about, flashes of light, like almost sort of like lightning streaks. And I don't really remember having this. I might have a little bit, but I, I probably, you know, I, I don't remember that being the major issue. But lightning, lightning streaks in the peripheral vision, the flashes occur when the vitreous pulls on the retina. So if you notice these symptoms, it's really, again, uh, crucial to seek medical attention immediately. In some cases, as the detachment progresses, you might notice a shadow or curtain coming down over your vision. Now, this is what I actually noticed. I noticed, a, a, again, a shadow sort of in the peripheral vision towards uh, my nose, uh, low down. And I was noticing this, like, shadow or, you know, whatever it was. And obviously, that was the detachment happening. Uh, and this occurs um, as the retina begins to lift away from the back of the eye, as we discussed and uh, at this point, the immediate treatment is essential to pre prevent uh, permanent vision loss. In my case, it ended up being that the surgeon said that it lift about 20, I think 20% of the retina had lifted up. So it was not a complete detachment. It was a partial detachment. Obviously, that's going to have a better, it's going to have a, a better prognosis. But again, if you visualize it, it's basically you get this tear in the curtain, you got fluid back there, the fluid gets under the curtain and starts pulling it up. And then it's a race against time because you don't want this curtain to get completely pulled up and gone away from blood supply and all of a sudden you lose your vision entirely. In terms of risk, you know, not everyone's at the same risk for retinal tears and detachment. So there's lots of different factors uh, that can increase your likelihood of developing uh, these kinds of conditions. For me, um, when I think about, uh, when I look at some of the big risk factors, the most striking one is high myopia, or in other words, severe nearsightedness. Um, uh, it's one of the most significant risk factors, actually, because in people with uh, who are really nearsighted, the eye is longer than normal, which means the retina is more stretched and thinner, and that makes it more susceptible to tearing. So in my case, uh, I was very, very nearsighted. Um, I had a minus seven, minus eight. I was basically legally blind. Um, but remarkably, because of the miracle of modern medicine, I had LASIK surgery and um, I was corrected to better than 2020. So it was uh, pretty crazy. And by the way, in changing your vision uh, from being extremely nearsighted, to um, you know, being better than 2020 because of LASIK surgery, that doesn't actually decrease your risk of a retinal tear because your anatomy is the same, right? And so, so yeah, it's important to remember that even if you uh, have great vision because you had LASIK, uh, that and and you're really nearsighted, this still um, it certainly uh, um, 
something that you're at higher risk for. I got to imagine, you know, the vitreous and the floaters that I had before, again, probably were suggestive of abnormal vitreous, maybe something stickier or whatever as well that went into this as well. Um, other known risk factors are, you know, a history of eye surgery in the past, like cataract surgery. Trauma to the eye is a big one. Um, I've known people who, uh, at least one person who was in a car accident uh, in her teens and, um, you know, had a de detached retina from that and then for many years was fine and then went uh, scuba diving and, and unfortunately because of the pressure differential that the, the, the retina detached again and then she lost her vision completely in that eye so it's unfortunate but you know that's something to to uh, think about in terms of risk factors there's certain genetic conditions as well uh, so if you fall into any of these categories again it's you know important especially important just you know to be aware of these particular uh, symptoms so let's go back to my situation let's talk about what what the surgical experience was so when my retinal tear and detachment were diagnosed I basically like I said a couple hours later I'm in surgery and the goal was to reattach the uh, retina to the back of the eye and prevent any further damage in my case the surgeon used um, you know a laser uh, basically to um, uh, basically create uh, some to put the retina back in place and to kind of um, scar it back in place with some laser incisions. And then um, to to hold it in place, they put a gas bubble back there. And so right now I'm like looking through a gas bubble and then I, it's really hard to see. It's literally like looking through. If you can imagine like those bubbles that you blow when you're a kid, it's like looking through that. I can't, I can't really see. But the good news is that I can tell that I have vision and I don't really have that shadow as far as I can tell anymore. So hopefully that what that means is that everything, um, at least according to my surgeon, went great and uh, I don't have any long-term uh, implications of this. But again, the point of that gas bubble, as you can imagine, uh, to is, is to basically act as a splint and it holds the retina in place uh, while it heals. So the way they do that is they carefully position the bubble uh, in the eye and, and the, the, the purpose again is to press the retina back against the wall of the eye um, and allows it to you know heal and reattach as part of that the positioning of that is uh, tr interesting uh, because basically for the last several days I have had my face down position um, almost non-stop and if you are watching this on YouTube you can still see I'm trying at least to mostly uh, keep my head down uh, and be a good patient and you know for about 10 days or so it's kind of uh, really important and uh, after the 10th day uh, I've been told that I can kind of move my head at will any way I like uh, except I can't lie on my back because again the bubble then pushes on the uh, the front part of the eye the anterior part of the eye as we say and that can potentially damage uh, some of the anterior structures of the eye so this um, this positioning again is the whole idea is the bubble stays in the right place and that the retina can heal properly. So it's not the most comfortable experience. In fact, it's, you know, surgery itself, all that wasn't terrible. Uh, the vision not, you know, looking through a bubble is not that fun, but honestly it saved my vision. So it's all good. I'm not, I'm not complaining at all. Uh, the only thing that's really bugging me really is that like having my head down all the time is, it's hurting my neck, man. It's hurting my neck. So I've got this contraption. Um, it's like a, um, it's, it, you know, if you look at those massage chairs that you have for shoulder rubs, that kind of thing, it looks like that, except it's a little bit directed down more. So I'm closer to like 90 degrees. Uh, but uh, yeah, I've been using that. But, you know, when I'm not in that, I look straight down. I have been exercising. In fact, I've been doing like the treadmill and it's like some weird guy in the gym looking straight down at his shoes the whole time while he's while he's on a, a treadmill going uphill uh, at like 14 degrees. Uh, so uh, that's that's been th that's been what I've been doing. So I've been following all the advice that I've gotten and trying to like, you know, keep, you know, a lot of increased pressure from entering my eye. So unfortunately, I'm not doing any serious heavy lifting uh, right now, which is kind of bums me out because I had been um, making some big gains again on my bench press, uh, but it is what it is. Anyway, one of the key takeaways from my experience is the importance of prompt treatment 
And the reason I thought this would make a reasonable show and a good show given this is that, you know, whoever thinks of that, right? Whoever thinks of these things, like not very often, unless you have a family member who went through this to think about like, okay, all of a sudden you get sudden floaters, flashes of light or a little shadow over your vision. And again, mine was subtle. It was not something that was really alarming to me, but it was a medical emergency. So if you notice anything like that, or if somebody you're around notices something like that, make sure they seek medical attention immediately because early diagnosis uh, and uh, treatment are ultimately like uh, critical to to permanent vision loss, which is with this kind of uh, problem, it's inevitable. It's not, it's not something that is going to heal on its own. So anyway, I'm sharing this story, uh, not uh, to talk about what happened to me, but to raise awareness about the condition. Because like in my case, if you, you catch it early enough, you can be treated successfully, and that's the moral of the story. So think about your risk factors uh, uh, as well. Um, you know, if you're a high myope, really nearsighted, you're at a higher risk. Uh, if you've got, you know, any sort of lens implants or anything like that, you're at a higher risk. Um, just be vigilant. That's all I've got for you this week. Uh, I'm going to stop staring at the scre screen and start staring downward again. If you find this video helpful, make sure you share it. Uh, with anyone who you might think might benefit from the information. If you have any questions about what happened to me, shoot me an email, buck at sapiopodcast.com. And uh, I will see you next week. Thanks for listening to Sapio with Buck Joffrey. A quick reminder that while I am in fact a surgeon, nothing I say should be construed as medical advice. Now make sure to include your physician in any medical decisions you make. And also, if you're enjoying the show, please make sure to show your support with a like, share, or subscribe. Until next time, this is Buck Joffrey for Sapio with Buck Joffrey.